Hello, my name is Tawny Smith, and I'm one of the members here at Desert Grace. I'm excited to share this Sunday's message with you. Would you take a moment right now to subscribe to our channel? And if you like the video, be sure to give us a thumbs up so that we know you've been blessed. You can do those things below. Um, Unilateral. Unilateral describes something done or undertaken by one party. So if you have two parties that maybe ought to be a part of a decision, unilateral is one of those parties making the choice without involving the other, right? And so actually there's a lot of places where this ends up coming up. And one of them, and it generally brings conflict, is when there's any kind of unilateral decision making taking place in a marriage, right? So if one or the other spouses just suddenly decides that it's time for a new car and goes out and spends the nest egg on the new car, that is probably going to bring up a little bit of conflict. It also happens in the workplace. You may have a team of people who are supposed to be making decisions. And when one person decides that either they, by title or whatever else, can make whatever decision they want and everybody else just has to be okay with it, there's going to be conflict. It's just, it's just part of what's going to happen. You, you see, the thing is, with unilateral decisions, no one likes a dictator. Unless you are the dictator, and then it might be kind of fun. But no one likes a dictator, and no one likes to feel powerless. Kind of the out-of-control thing that sometimes causes us issues in our our, uh, relationships. Conflict in any form often can lead to feelings of anger. Regardless of of what causes the conflict or what the conflict is over or, or what sort of issues you might be facing, sometimes when we are facing conflict, it immediately becomes something where we start to feel anger. Anger is an emotional response, okay? So there's what happened, and then there's the emotions that are behind it. That's where anger comes in. Because sometimes we get angry over a conflict we think we're in that the person we think we're in a conflict with isn't actually in with us. (laughs) That we have perceived something that isn't actual. That we've perceived that somebody has slighted us or, or, or somebody has whatever. I don't know about you, but have you ever been in the grocery store and saw somebody who you think you know and it seems like they're avoiding you? Let me just be clear. When I do that to you, I'm focused on going in, getting what I need and getting out. I might or might not notice that you're three aisles over trying to chase me down. (laughs) But don't be angry over it. If I don't want to talk to you, you'll come up and say hi, and I'll say, I don't know you. (laughs) Three times. Three times, yeah. (laughs) We, by our very natures, are going to experience some conflict every day single day. Uh, Maybe, maybe you can manage not to have any conflict, but I don't think it's true. If you were to stay at home all day long, you are going to have conflict. You want to know how I know this? It's just when you start to relax that the telemarketer signal goes off and they begin to call. (laughs) It's just when you thought it was safe to turn on the TV that the news person is talking about something that just really irritates you. And if you have kids, it's just when you begin to doze off that the radar goes off and they need a very important question answered. Like, can I use the restroom? I don't know, are you capable? Yeah, well, then do it. 
We've been talking about the root of all conflict. The root of all conflict is our conflict with God. And by the way, we haven't really talked about this leading up to the sermon. For those of you who haven't been here, I'm going to go through it all real quickly. But for those of you that have, I want to stop and park on this for just a second. Because one of the problems that we have is that sometimes we go into an all-out war with God, and then we get angry with God that he's so far away that we haven't reconciled with him. Now, God has come to reconcile with us, but then we say, hey, uh, you know what? Not good enough. So you sent your son to die for us. What about this? What about that? I- I've seen people do this. I- I've seen people who, who they have, have started a war with God, sinned against him, and they, they don't understand why their life isn't going well, but then they throw up every reason why they should not be a friend of God. Every reason why they should not be in harmony with God. And they talk about the children that get hurt. They talk about diseases that ravage. They, they talk about things which are really just sin in the world that just took over when we fell into sin and started our all-out war. We have to be careful about that anger. We do, and make sure that we have settled our conflict with God. One of the main sources of conflict is pride, our our conceit, or our ego. And what does this result in? You may remember, if you've been with us the last few weeks, it results in us needing to be little g gods and goddesses, where we need to be worshipped ourselves where we are demanding from others that they treat us a certain way and that they approach us a certain way and that they do things around us a certain way and that we become the most important. That's going to cause some pride. One of the things that concerns us is that we tend to want to be in control, but we really don't have any control. We don't have any control, and sometimes this has caused issues because we want people to come to us in certain ways, and when they don't, then they have offended us, then we might get angry, and then we cut them out of our lives forever. But the other thing that we sometimes do is we expect others to come to us. And like I said a little bit ago, sometimes other people don't know they've offended us, and we're sitting around waiting for them to come and apologize, and they may die in the process, or you might die. And either way, it's not healthy. So... Realize you don't have control. We generally use this dysfunctional conflict resolution model where it's dependent on you coming to me and not me coming to you. Where, hey, if you have wronged me, you need to come to me and make things right. It's, it's on your shoulders to do. Well, God has a different idea. You know, he came to us first, not us to him. That's the good news. The good news is that God has given us this gift of reconciliation. He said, I want to be your friend. I want to live in harmony with you. That's exciting. Come on. Takes longer if you guys don't amen very often. eh? You're sleeping in the first five minutes. We're going to anyway. (laughs) He calls us then to be ambassadors of the gift that he has given us that we become his ambassadors, which means that we can legitimately put everything aside because we need to see everyone else in our world as God sees them. That's exciting stuff. It frees us up to to just worship God. That's really what it is. But one of the things we haven't yet talked about is what the effect of conflict on worship is. Because there is an effect of conflict on worship. And, and while I wouldn't say that it, it has to be every time or, or all the time, I do think there are times when we enter God's throne room in, in a sort of self-centered, egotistical, trying to control things way. And I think there's times when we enter God's realm angry when we ought not be angry. Jesus speaks about this in the Sermon on the Mount, and and some of you, this is a very familiar passage. It's something that, you know, really easy for us to follow, and we don't usually have to think too much about it, Um, but you might be familiar with the passage. This is Matthew chapter 5, starting at verse 21, we're going to go to verse 26. You have heard it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, 
that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister, and by the way, everyone is your brother and sister, will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, and everyone is your brother and sister, Raka is answerable to the court. No one's ever called me that. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them and then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way or your adversary may hand you over to the judge and the judge may hand you over to the officer and you might be thrown into prison. Truly I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. Jesus starts off there and, and he makes that really incredible statement, right? Right? You've heard it said that you shouldn't murder somebody else. You shouldn't take somebody else's life. And I've, I've talked about this a few times and a few different things. And, and one of the things that I always say is, I don't think too many of us are really struggling much with the idea of, I'm going to go out and actually literally kill somebody. Now, occasionally I'll bring that up and somebody will kind of give me sort of a, a nervous chuckle. And I'm keeping notes. <laughs> You'll know you're on the list if ever you say, I'd like to have an appointment with you. And I say, okay, in a public place. <laughs> or are you angry with me? Because if you are, it definitely needs to be in a public place. I, I don't think most of us are going around. We can be so angry at somebody, but our first thought is, and I'm going to take that person out, hopefully. If you have, let's talk later in public, somewhere where we can... Well, out on the patio would be okay. Lots of people around, okay? You know, normally, I don't know too many people that go, you know, hey, I'd like to have an accountability group. Could you, could you put together an accountability group? Sure, what, what do you want to be held accountable to? Well, you know, I'm really worried I'm going to kill somebody. I just, it's, not, it's not something that normally comes up in, in, in conversation, and, and I think people would keep that to themselves anyway. Jesus, though, says that anger is a sin equal to murder. If sin is what separates us from God, basically God is saying when you get angry at somebody else, it's just like as though you had killed them. As far as I'm concerned. Now, most of us want to put a little asterisk in there. We want to put a little footnote down at the bottom and we want to say that God only meant that if they didn't make you mad first. <laughs> right? That there are certain things. But, but what, what Jesus says is that if you are angry, you'll be answerable in a court. In like a court of law, just for being angry, if that was something that we could go to court, our courts would be so jam-packed. If every time somebody was angry at somebody else, we said, all right, fine, we'll go to court and get this settled. Some of us would spend all day in court. <laughs> Jesus' statement sort of does this interesting thing, because what it says is, it's not just about taking somebody else's life, it's about what is the motivation that you have. What is the motivation behind what you're doing? What is the motivation? What is the, really the heart condition that causes you to be angry and to begin to do some of these things to somebody else? And so I don't know how you can open a window into motivation in a court of law. I know they try to do it, but I don't know that it's very easy to do if it's not cut and dry. And part of the problem is, is that we need to have an actual act before we can actually consider somebody's motivation. So if you're angry at me and you begin to yell at me, the very first thing that I'm going to think of is what, is, what is it that you are trying to communicate to me? What did I do to you? What are you doing to me? And what's your motivation? What's my motivation? And how do those things all match up? This happens every time somebody gets mad at you. Well, first we go, oh, what a jerk. 
Right? I only know that because nobody ever gets mad at me except when I'm driving. Troublemakers in the second row, I'll tell you. She's supposed to be over here. The, the realization is that, you know, I don't, I'll give you a perfect example. I was getting on the freeway over there by Walmart. I was heading west. There was a car way back there. It was going kind of fast. But you know how when you're getting on the freeway, people oftentimes will jump in because there's nobody else around? Well, I realized about the time that I couldn't really slow down or go any faster than they were going, that they weren't going to move, and we were going to be at the same time at the same place. And so, in a sense, I ended up cutting them off. And so this nice, wonderful, older couple who slowed down to wave at me with only one finger and... <laughs> I'm pretty sure they were telling me that they appreciated that, that I was on the road with them and that, you know, they looked a little angry about it. Maybe they, I don't know, I don't, you know, those are the sorts of things. Did I intentionally do something? Was my motivation to hurt them? Of course not. Anyway. We have to be careful about this. So we have to have the act to even consider what the motivation might be. Right? Because without an act, all I have to do is consider what motivated you to do whatever it is that you didn't do. Right? So, let me kind of break this down a little further. You all committed an act this morning that allows me to consider where your heart might be. Are you ready? You came in and you sat down. That was an act. Now, what is your motivation? I would hope that your motivation was that you came in here because we are going to worship God. It's going to be a wonderful time together. When we leave, we will have encountered God. Amen. Either that or you just know that, hey, I might tell a joke or two and you might have something new to say. In the end, only God knows our heart. How can a local court judge, if we were to take people to court over these things, how could a local court judge see any kind of motivation other than to look at our act and take a wild, passionate guess? There's no possible way. Jesus goes a little further. He says, even using an insult towards someone is a no-no. That's where you get the whole, uh, the whole thing about don't call people names. He actually says a little further in this one that you're not just simply subject to judgment, that you're not simply going to end up in court. You're going to end up in Gehenna, which is basically the fiery place. And so it's basically this idea. Now, the Gehenna is really the Valley of Hinnom, and there was a lot of things that were a part of that. They had human sacrifices there. They, they eventually just started burning all of their trash there. And so basically what Jesus is saying, you're going to be subject and you, when you insult somebody to being thrown on the trash heap and burnt to, to ashes. That's basically what he's saying. And so he gives a couple of things. Raka is a transliteration of a, uh, oh my goodness, it was a Hebrew word or a Greek word, I don't remember. No one is exactly certain what it means, but it's something like this. Blockhead, <laughs> idiot, fool, um, exactly what they meant it as. Let's just put it this way. It is not a complimentary word. You didn't walk up to somebody you loved and say, hey, how's it going? Hey, you know, it just wasn't part of it. Here's something that's really important to us. Now, we, in today's day and age, often will give nicknames, right? Yeah. We'll often call people by a nickname or some other name or whatever else. Back then, your original name had a, a specific meaning. And so, if somebody called you something else, what they were really saying was, this is who you really are in your character. So, like now, you know, you ever meet somebody and you're like, hey, that person's name is whatever, but I keep thinking of them as this because they look like one of these to me? <laughs> Some of you that. 
<laughs> but, you know, you kind of have this thing, and we name our kids, and, and we don't necessarily think, okay, I'm naming my kids so that they will become this kind of person. But back then, that's what you did. So you would never name your kid, hey, fool. <laughs> uh, of course, some of the names people are coming up with this day. This, you know. <laughs> did you just, like, go to a Scrabble game and the first six letters you pulled out are the name? I'm not, anyway. It's possible that fool could be translated rebel, specifically a rebel against God. Now, that doesn't sound like it's the worst insult in the world. But again, when we're talking about these are names that then describe who you are, who become your very identity, then essentially what happens if somebody calls you a rebel against God, they are basically saying you are going to hell. You, you are not worthy. You are not anything else. So somebody uses that kind of language. It's not just a matter of sort of a careless, oh, you cut me off in traffic sort of thing. It's actually saying, this is me judging you as a person. And I'm giving you a new name, and your new name is Raka, idiot, blockhead, whatever, or fool, or rebel. That's a difficult thing for us to do. Now, I want us to make sure we have this straight. We have a duty to judge actions. To look at something and go, that is something that either pleases God or that is something that displeases God. And we should be doing that, and especially within the church, in a way of being able to say, you know what, let me come and talk to you about something. There's actually a whole biblical process about what should happen if somebody is doing something wrong so that we can be correcting, that we can do it in love, we wouldn't just immediately call a name and say this is who you are because we're judging you. Saying one is behaving foolishly isn't saying that that person is a fool, especially in our day and age. But to say that was a foolish action, that's okay. It's, it's loving and correcting, right? So here's one other thing. When we hurl insults at somebody else, it's sometimes a sign of an inability to be forgiving. I'm pretty sure the older couple that passed me on the roadway were trying to forgive me. <laughs> no. <laughs> but the willingness to say, this is something that I could also do a mistake I could also make. This is a hurt that I could inflict on somebody else. This is something that isn't unique to me, but part of our human condition. And so when it happens to you, when you do it against me, I should forgive. And when I do it against others, I should be forgiven. And when we begin to hurl insults at people, we're, we're kind of giving them a sign that says, I'm not willing to forgive your transgression. Keep that in mind. Jesus sort of establishes this manner, and then he says, look, reconciliation needs to come before worship. So, so you have this idea of here is the problem. You've heard it said that you should not murder, or you'll be answerable. I say that not only should you not murder, but when you are angry at someone else, you have separated yourself from me. When you are hurling insults at somebody else, you are separating yourself from me. That's what God says. I didn't make that up. It's in the scripture. We already read it. If you need to go back and read it again, go for it. But the reality is that Jesus says, look, before anything else, we need to have this reconciliation in our lives. Austin, I lost control. <laughs> it won't change. I'm pretty sure the next thing I'm going to say is talking about this idea that Jesus is talking about a therefore. We know that any time that you get to therefore in the Bible, you need to figure out what it's so, he says, in light of everything that you just heard me say that about murder and about anger and about insults, here's what you need to know. 
If you remember that someone has something against you, leave your gift there at the altar, go make it right, and then come back. Now, here's the problem with that kind of thinking in our day and age. We do have altars up here. We only offer sacrifices of praise and prayer at them. But back in Jesus' time, they were offering a little more than praises and prayer. They were offering a little more like, I don't know, a goat or a lamb or a dove, right? And so here's what happens in my imagination is that you have this incredible practical issue. Because if I have come to the altar with my goat ready to sacrifice it to get through the Lord and go, oh, oh, I got to go make things right with so-and-so. Let me just leave this here and leave. There's going to be a little goat running around <laughs> or some doves flying all over the room. Didn't think about that when we read the passage, did you? You were thinking, oh, well, I'll bring my check and I'll leave the check on the altar. That would be fine. The check wouldn't go anywhere. But a, a living sacrifice that you are bringing to the altar is going to go away. By the time you find whoever it is and come back, it's going to be gone. And I say that because there's a lot of scholars that kind of go, you know, is Jesus just sort of using a lot of exaggeration here? Because this is not practical. This is an issue. And I think part of what Jesus is trying to do is say, settle these things before you ever think about coming into worship. That part of getting ready to worship me is going through the accounts of everybody in your life and saying, hey, is there somebody that I need to make things right with? And by the way, sometimes you need to make right something that the other person doesn't know is wrong. I'll never forget a time when I was in college and, and I ran sound for chapel and the, the men's choir was going to sing for chapel and, and the, the director of the choir gave me some very specific instructions on how he wanted the sound run. I tried to fo follow them absolutely dutifully and, and everything else. And, and so he was up directing the choir and I didn't have any clue at the time, but he felt like I wasn't following his directions and that it made the choir not sound as good as they should have sounded. And so he was getting more and more angry with me. And, and by the time he was done, he was really upset that I had ruined his concert. He never told me this, ever. But later on, he went over and he was talking to some of his fellow music faculty members and one of them said, that was the best I've ever heard your choir sound. <laughs> and another one said, yes, you know, the voice mixing and all of that and, and the sound guy didn't overdo this or underdo this. It was just perfect. So now he had gotten himself all angry because it sounds different when you're on stage than when you're in the audience. And he was all riled up. Now, I could have gone my entire life never knowing that he was really angry with me. But I also worked for security, and we had a little booth at the front of the campus, and this particular professor lived just a couple blocks off campus, so he always walked. And one Saturday morning, it's nice and quiet, and I was studying, looking around, and here he comes walking up, stops to tell me, hey, I need to, to, to ask for your forgiveness. What? And recounts the whole story. That's how I know the story to tell you. And says, would you forgive me? And I, of course I will. I mean, I didn't even know you were mad. <laughs> so... So to, to think about the idea that, that in order for us to be right with other people, sometimes we have to go to people who didn't know we were mad at them, even though we know that we were mad at them, and to say, I need to reconcile with you. There's an issue here, and we got to be careful about that. I want to make sure you understand that I think this whole thing is less about practice and more about urgency. That it's less about, hey, I'm here with my doves to, to sacrifice them to the Lord and offer them to the Lord. And oh no, I need to make things right with so-and-so. I think it's more about, hey, when you get there and you realize this, the very next thing on your list had better be to go and reconcile. Don't stop. Don't pass go. Don't collect $200. Just go reconcile. 
Because it's urgent, it's important. The urgency that we should have in our lives is toward reconciliation. Two of you. It might be implied that angry worship is not acceptable to God. Think about that for a minute. That what Jesus is saying is God would rather not have your sacrifice if you're angry. Not just if you're angry with God, but if you're angry with any brother or sister. I don't know. I want to pretend like God is just happy no matter what, right? But God does want certain things from us, and, and clearly he wants us to get along with our brothers and our sisters. He talks about it a lot. So I'm thinking that Jesus is telling us that we'd better have things right or God isn't very happy with whatever we have to offer. Another urgent reconciliation that Jesus speaks of is settling with an adversary out of court. The, the word translated adversary in the NIV can only be used for someone who's taking you to court. That's it. It's the only possibility. And so the idea is that someone is taking you to court, someone is going to, to, to get you in front of a judge, and something is going to happen. And what Jesus said is, regardless of anything else, settle the matter before you get to court. Don't wait. Don't wait until you're in front of the judge and hope for the best. Don't wait until everything else is just right and do it then. You should go now and try to settle. It says settle on the way. On the way could be like, oh, I don't know, anything between here and there, right? And from the moment that you first find out you're going to go to court, all the way up, try to do it before you're walking through the doors. I think that's what he's saying. I read a lot of commentaries on this. Some of them say, you know, maybe there's an idea here that it's an unfair accusation. Not that that ever happens, and anybody would sue somebody unfairly, but, but maybe it's an unfair accusation or, or a false witness or anything like that. I don't know that it matters. It doesn't necessarily imply that to me in the text, and, and I'll get to that right now, because in verse 26, it sort of suggests this is a debt. This is a financial thing. Now, one of the problems with that is that the Jews didn't have a debtor's prison. So it's not thinking of a Jewish prison. But, uh, but the reality is, is that it says you're going to be put in jail until the last penny is paid in full. So this is somebody you may owe money to. And what Jesus is saying is don't wait. Settle it now. Make the matter before you get to court. <laughs> I think in practice, we like to do it the other way. I think in practice, the other person knows they're right or they wouldn't be taking you to court. And of course, you know you're right, so you're ready to defend yourself. I remember getting a traffic ticket once and I was sick when I got the ticket and it was a parking ticket and I didn't think it was right. I was with the car and everything else and I decided that I was going to fight this ticket. I took pictures of the fact that there weren't any signs that even warned me about such a thing. I was ready to go and I was going to fight this. It was just, I was just, I was ready. And, and so they have everybody come in and, and you're in this, it actually was more like a trailer than a real courtroom, but it doesn't matter. There was a judge, there were all these people and, and the room was just jam-packed with people who were sure they were right. A bunch of police officers, they were sure they were right. And a bunch of, uh, of us who were ready to just fight our case. I had everything ready. I was so eager to, to take care of this issue. And right when court was supposed to start, they called up like seven names. And mine was one of them. And I thought, well, I wonder what that's all about. That's not what I was expecting. And they had us all stand. And they said, all of your cases are dismissed. You are forgiven. I got pictures and documentation. <sighs> I think that's the way we are. 
Jesus says, don't be that way. Try to settle it on the way. Try to figure it out. Try to make it right. Even if you are not wrong. Try to make it right. This is about making a friend out of an enemy. Your adversary is not your friend. Friends don't take friends to court. Can we just be clear on that? The Bible talks about, you know, if you're going to loan a friend some money, consider it a gift. Don't worry about getting repaid. You've heard that before. I think that we have to realize that what God wants us to do is try to make friends, not because we are such great people, but because he is such a great God and he wants everybody under his tent. Hmm. The important thing to do is find harmony, which, by the way, sounds a lot like being reconciled, right? To make friends out of, to, to find harmony, to be able to get along with, to, to be able to coexist in a happy way. Here's the thing about this court case. It's incredibly urgent to take care of it right away because there is limited time before the action is going to be complete. And once you're in the courtroom, your window of opportunity is closed. Your window of opportunity is done. It's urgent. Time is limited. If anyone is angry with you this morning and you know why they're angry with you, you should be going to them and trying to make it right. Hmm. Because time is limited to make things right. None of us knows that we have tomorrow even promised to us. Jesus is trying to say reconciliation is so important. Don't wait. Don't wait. Because there's no possibility for something else to happen once the judgment is handed down. There's a couple other thoughts you can have in there, and I'll save you the time. These examples show that there's no better time than now to reconcile. Whether you're angry at somebody, whether you keep thinking you should call somebody a particular name that might not be flattering, whatever it might be, there's no better time than right now to reconcile with whoever it should be. I did want to point out, though, that with one issue with reconciliation is that it takes two. It takes two. You can't reconcile and be one-sided reconciliation. The other person has to accept what you're saying. When you look at Jesus, you might have noticed that his ministry created a lot of conflict. You might have noticed that everywhere that Jesus went, people were calling him names, were talking bad about him, all of these sorts of things. And he, I'm sure, would love to have reconciled with everybody but it takes two. It takes two. I think that's a hard idea for us. How do we define success? We define success as essentially we got what we went in to get. So we sometimes withhold reconciliation because we're concerned that when we go, reconciliation won't happen. The number one reason why friends don't bring up other friends' inequities and try to make things right is because they're worried they're going to lose the friend forever. Hmm. Because it takes two. When you think of everything that Jesus went through and what was his whole role? Reconciliation. Reconciliation. I thought, you know, what would Jesus be like if he had demanded reconciliation? No, you must reconcile with me. I don't know what that would be like. I thought about this. Paul's words back when we studied the very first sermon in this series, that we are to implore people to reconcile that our role is as ambassadors of Christ to go to people and implore them to accept the same reconciliation that we have accepted to eliminate our conflict with God. So it may take two, 
But our job is to implore other people to be reconciled to God and to one another. That, that's our job. But in the end, an offer of friendship and harmony just might not be accepted. Didn't work for God necessarily every time, does it? Doesn't work for us every time. That professor that came up, I could have said, well, you jerk. I did my best. <laughs> that wouldn't have ended very well, I'll just tell you that. <laughs> wouldn't be nearly the same story it is today. <laughs> but the reality is there. God wants everyone to do it. Not everyone's going to accept. And I think Jesus' concern is not so much about whether or not we're out saving the entire world. I think Jesus' concern is about how good of a job we're doing at being his ambassadors. Are we going out and seeing people with his eyes? Are we going out and imploring people to be reconciled to him? Are we doing our best to be reconciled with one another and with those around us? Hmm. Conflict is not always easy to resolve and it's not always going to be received the way we want it to be received, but it is what we're supposed to do. We've got to make sure that we are trying to resolve it or it's going to seep into other areas of our life and we're going to have problem after problem after problem after problem. And one of those would be in worship. What is the effect of conflict on worship? I have three ideas for you this morning. The first one is simply this. Angry worship is self-worship. When you approach the throne of God and you are angry, you are not approaching the throne of God for his sake. You're approaching it for your own. That's a hard thing to realize, but when we talk about becoming gods and goddesses to be worshipped, then we become that god and goddess, and we come to God and we say, look, in order to remain on your side and to have you on our side, we will offer you this worship, but really, we're the ones who want to be worshipped, and can you take care of this problem for us? And if you didn't know it, that's not worship. That's not worship at all. We can actually find ourselves coming in front of God and beginning to compare our actions with the actions of others, saying that, look what I did. I did the right thing. They did the wrong thing. Now go send lightning to them. <laughs> nah, we wouldn't do that <clears throat> on a Sunday. We want God to, to sort of validate our own position and kind of make the other person just, you know, make them pay, Lord. Make them pay. This is what happens when we're angry. Our worship becomes self-seeking. Our worship becomes all about us, all about what we've had happen to us, all about our issues, not about the God who came, who reconciled himself to us, and who we are supposed to be worshiping. It's nothing about that. But by the way, I'm going to put a little asterisk right here. Sometimes we approach the throne of God angry because of the church. Now, I'll say a couple of things to you right now. One is I apologize on behalf of the church, the larger church, because it's a human institution and it is fallible. We make mistakes but hold our feet to the fire if we aren't keeping God first. Hold our feet if we're not keeping God first. But if your biggest concern is, oh my goodness, the color of the carpet. The bathroom was not as clean as I thought it ought to be. The preacher's tie is ugly. I've heard that before, just so you know. <laughs> Could have picked a better tie, Pastor. Okay. No reason to get angry about it. It's done now. So many different things. 
We can't have unhealthy conflict within the church body. We talked a little bit of last week about there's such thing as a healthy amount of conflict. Paul and Barnabas had a healthy amount of conflict. That was okay. Uh, and they, they handled it in a certain way. And, and so there can be some of those, unhe- or those healthy conflicts. But the minute it becomes angry, the minute it becomes unhealthy, unless you're angry because we have decided not to reach out to our community, you may not have a right to be angry. Because you may not be worshiping God, you might be worshiping you. We've got to avoid self-worship. Ideally, let's deal with conflict before we're angry. That'd be easy. Second thing is angry worship is false worship. Angry worship is false worship. It's just pretend. It's just a game. It simply isn't possible for us to be consumed by a perceived wrong and also be consumed in worshiping God. We can only worship one of those two things. So it's not a true worship of God. You see, authentic worship demands our full attention. It demands everything that we are, every sense of our being, that we are listening, that we are considering what God would say to us, and that we, even while we are singing, realize that God can speak to us through the very words that we are speaking and some that he can add in in the middle. Hmm. But it takes our full attention. It takes it all. Is there conflict in your life this morning that kept you from authentic worship? (laughs) Nah, not in this room. We would never do that. And God wants you to be able to focus completely on him. I want you to think about it. You remember Cain? You know how long he was able to hate his brother? just as long as he was able. (laughs) I can't help it. (laughs) The reality is that you know that one's offering was accepted and one's offering was not accepted. And, of course, Cain being the one that didn't have his offering accepted, got a little bit angry. Imagine what happens when you're angry because God accepts one offering but not yours. And what do we tend to do when that happens? Do we say, oh, Lord, let me use my sort of anger to do the right thing? (laughs) We walk away from God. We have no idea why Keynes wasn't accepted, but is it because he was angry? Hmm. Finally, angry worship is lonely worship. Angry worship is lonely worship. When we are angry, we are actually worshiping unilaterally. Okay? Okay? And here's what I mean by that. When we are angry, we are not connected to the rest of the people who are sitting in this room because we're usually focused on what we're angry about. And there may not be anybody else in here angry as you. The second thing is, when you are so angry that you're only thinking about what it is that you're angry about, you are not participating with God He's not able to get through. Have you thought about that? Conflict, anger, it places the emphasis on you. It places the emphasis on me, even when we think we're trying to come to God. Anger has no point, no place in worship. The simplest solution is to consider yourself an ambassador. Somebody makes you angry. 
<laughs> you just say, hey, Lord, I see them through your eyes. They're worthy of love. They're worthy of forgiveness. And even if that other person can't or isn't willing to participate, I'm going to do my part. It may not end up in wonderful things. We talked about that. But if we do our part, we've done everything we need to do. And in case I haven't mentioned it yet, this is an urgent matter. We don't have time to wait. We don't know how much time we have to make things right or to have things go the way God wants them to go. We need to be working now. Just a quick reminder, we should solve our conflicts like Christ resolved his conflicts. First thing he did is he released all control. It's all in the Father's hands. It's all what the Father's will is. It's all about the Father. The second thing is, is he was totally focused on others. When we can release control and we are no longer the ones who need to be made happy or whatever else, we can focus on other people's needs and what other people want. And then finally, we will reflect God's character to those around us. And what does God say? I come to you first and I reconcile with you first. Don't have to sit around and wait for somebody to come and say, gee, I'm so sorry I've offended you. They may not even know it. And finally, don't forget that worship isn't just in this place. The real worship begins when you walk out those doors and start living your life. You've got to keep that in mind. Does your anger conflict with worship? No, nah, not in this room. Mm. Don't kill people. Don't be angry with people. Don't hurl insults at, peop insults at people. <laughs> Approach God as an agent of reconciliation. That's worship. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to be in this place this morning. We thank you that you first came to reconcile with us. We thank you that you are a God who, who just works in mighty ways. And that one of the ways you work is you just allow us to simply look at what you want to do in our lives. And that we can just allow you to do that very thing. Lord, if there's any here this morning who are angry, if there's any here this morning who are just feeling so hurt that this morning they were more concentrated on whatever their pain is than you, take that pain away. Help us to be agents of recon reconciliation. Help all of the conflicts that we may face this week be reflective of how you would resolve them. And Lord, we just ask your blessings on each and every one that's here and that you'd keep us safe until we have the opportunity to worship you together once again. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks for watching this sermon with me. If you've enjoyed your time with us, we'd invite you to join us in person for a service. Visit us at desertgrace.org or give us a call at 928-305-1132 for more information.